My name is Geoffrey Fige, uh, the CEO of Refugee. I have the great honor and privilege of daily work, waking up in the morning to serve a wonderful organization that I call a dream builder. For close to two years, I have enjoyed the privilege of inspiring young refugee women to believe in themselves and to pursue their personal destiny. So Refugee serves an accompanied and separated vulnerable refugee girls and children fleeing conflicts in their home countries and ending up in the slum areas of Nairobi. These children are not only traumatized, but often victims of gender-based abuse arising from their uh, flight history. Now, refugee girls and children and young women have been the most vulnerable. They are the first to be attacked. They are first to be trafficked for sex or child labor, first to be exploited as tools of war, and the first to lose their childhood. They are the last to be fed, last to be enrolled in school, and too often, the last to be valued and appreciated. So Refugees Integrated Model provides a holistic support to serve both the immediate and long-term needs of refugee girls, empowering participants to build skills and confidence to become catalysts of positive change in their communities. Refugees' approach is right-based, trauma-informed, girl-centered services to protect and empower refugee girls. Thanks so much, Joffrey. So as Joffrey mentioned, uh, mental health has been in our fiber from the start. Our programs were designed to be trauma-informed and mental health services are a part of our holistic model. What we do know is that enormous strides have been made in psychology and neuroscience research since our founding in 2008. We now know more about the brain and how trauma impacts the body and mind. So at Refugee, we're taking a three-prong approach to spearhead what we're calling a mental health renaissance. We're going to be deepening our service, so that provi means providing more services as well as a variety of different types of mental health services. We're going to increase access. So how do we bring mental health services to refugee populations that might not be on campus, um, but still need access to these services? And then last, redefining advocacy, which is we wanna actually change how we talk about mental health. My colleague, Jesse Wolves, our Chief Investment and Resource Officer, and I will touch on each of these three themes. Um, so to start, Jesse's going to kick us off about how we are deepening our mental health services. Jesse? Thank you, Jalen. Hi, everyone. Good morning and good evening. And uh, thank you for your attention. I'm going to take five minutes to walk you through a few initiatives we're very passionate about. But before I get into what we're doing, a quick background. Uh, if you attended the open house, you probably heard us use the word trauma or refer to trauma frequently. And that's because addressing mental health among the population we serve means addressing unhealed trauma and any lingering symptoms that, are, that they're experiencing. So the vast majority of young women and girls we serve have experienced complex trauma. So unlike an isolated event, such as an earthquake, a car accident, a single sexual assault, or an assault, any assault, complex trauma is multiple in its type, it's repetitive, and it happens over a long period of time. So for example, a refugee young woman before fleeing may have witnessed her loved ones either harmed or um, violently killed, or she herself may have experienced violence and of the sexual and gender-based nature. Uh, then during her flight journey, because she's unaccompanied or separated or so, not, so without guardians and maybe only with siblings or she's alone, she's very vulnerable to, um, as Geoffrey said, human trafficking, exploitation, and additional sexual and gender-based violence. And then upon arrival to Kenya, she's uh, vulnerable to exploitation um, some young women have to resort to survival sex to just make ends meet before they arrive to refugee. So throughout that time, she, uh, a young woman is experiencing different types of trauma over a long period of time. This is not unique to refugee girls. In fact, um, one academic study estimates that unaccompanied young refugees experience on average eight different types of traumatic events before, during, and after their migration. So what are we at Refugee doing about complex trauma? How will we address it? Well, one, we're going to upgrade our psychosocial services to make sure that they reflect the latest neuroscience on healing, like Jalon mentioned. Number two, 
we intend to provide young women and girls with psychoeducation on the science of trauma. So how does trauma affect the mind and body? We think that the education piece is really important and that's for two reasons. One, um, we want to normalize the experiences of young women. So we want them to feel, we want to normalize what it's like to be in their bodies every day. So helping them understand the physiological symptoms of trauma, but also helping them understand behaviors and thought patterns that may feel stuck that they can't seem to overcome. Also by educating them on trauma and its impact on the mind and body, we empower young women to have greater agency in their healing journey. So as many of you probably know from your own life experiences, it's only when you understand what it is that troubles you that you can take action to resolve it. So with that in mind, we've developed a workshop on the science of trauma that's catered for young women and girls that takes into account uh, varying education levels, low literacy levels, and a limited understanding of mental health and probably some challenging ideas around mental health. So um, this slide and the next slide that I'll show you are a snapshot of that workshop. And in this first slide, you can see we're simplifying neuroscience to try to make it more accessible to young women. Uh, and then on the second slide, uh, you can see how we are showing the different, the different um, statuses that the body can feel after trauma. So we'll be taking girls through what safe feels like, what hypervigilance or activated feels like, what dissociation or shutdown feels like. And again, normalizing that experience and those feelings and then educating young women on how to reclaim a sense of safety mentally and physiologically. So the rollout of this workshop is coming soon. We've just completed the training of our staff counselors on the contents and we'll be doing a pilot next, uh, but we will be taking it slowly, uh, even though we're very excited. But um, because this is very sensitive material, um, you know, do no harm is the number one principle. Other efforts toward deepening our mental health include uh, expanding our talk therapy services. That means we'll be hiring additional counselors so that we have a more sustainable counselor to client ratio. We'll also be extending talk therapy services to refugee women living in the community um, that uh, we already have a working relationship with. Additionally, we'll be incorporating somatic therapy into our mental health programming, and that is critical because neuroscience has shown you cannot talk your way out of trauma. You have to work with the whole body and especially the nervous system. So if any of you have read The Body Keeps the Score, this is the bottom-up approach that the author uh, refers to and states that it's essential. Uh, we've already started this in a, in a smaller way. We uh, have regular trauma-informed yoga classes at our safe house, but the plan once we are in the COVID clear is to have regular yoga and meditation classes on our education campus and also offer alternative therapies such as sound healing and dance therapy. And then our last big push to, as part of our deepen, deepening mental health is to bring EMDR therapy to refugees campus. So EMDR is a psychotherapy for trauma specifically. Uh, it involves bilateral movements on the body that traditionally was moving a finger back and forth um, in front of a client. Um, but also now there are other ways they're doing it, including tapping on opposite sides of the bodies of the body. Um, and EMDR has proven to be very effective in clinical trials and also relatively quick at alleviating the distress associated with traumatic memories. So we are currently developing a full-fledged academic research proposal that would uh, bring leading EMDR researchers to our campus to conduct clinical trials with refugee young women. And our intent is, is twofold. We want to, first of all, train our counselors in EMDR so that they can offer these services to the young women on a regular basis. And by bringing the leading world experts here, we also provide the best training in the world and also coaching from those um, professionals. But then um, we think it's really important to do this research on non-Western populations and specifically on refugee populations because that research is very limited in the mental health space. Jalon, back to you to go over briefly the other prongs of our mental health. Thanks, Jesse. So, so our second strategy is increasing access. As Jesse kind of went over, um, we are deepening our care on our campus. 
uh, with the women and girls that are enrolled in our girls empowerment program. However, mental health access is um, very difficult to come by out in the community for other refugees who are not part of our campus programs. And COVID actually gave us the opportunity to see that there's parts of our model um, including pieces of mental health that can be delivered digitally. So we are partnering with the MasterCard Foundation and two Kenyan technology companies, Kitabu and Wazi, to design an e-learning platform, an e-learning and wellness platform that will be used for refugees in urban areas to access educational content as well as mental health services. And then our third strategy is around advocacy. Um, so there's still so much taboo and misunderstanding around mental health that it often discourages people from seeking mental health services. It is one of the lowest uh, interventions that are funded from a donor perspective. And then lastly, it's often ignored in policy making. So we want to shift that conversation um, what we're actually talking about is, is brain health. And in the same way that one gets your, our hearts and our lungs checked, we should be checking on our brain's health. Um, it's interesting, right? The brain is sort of the, the epicenter of our human ecosystem, what's going on in our body. It is what drives our other organs. And it is, you know, it is the organ that essentially makes us unique from one another. And yet it's sort of the last one that we take care of. Um, in fact, we often don't even check on our brain's health until something is wrong. Um, so we are really working to change that discussion internally, centering our program around brain health, but we also hope to inspire others in the sector to do the same thing. We know that our brain's health impacts everything else. We know it impacts educational outcomes, for example. And yet again, it's usually a secondary or tertiary intervention in terms of how we support um, refugee populations and, and all populations. Um, so with that, I'm gonna pass it along to my colleague, Lois Kamau, who's the Associate Director of our Girls Empowerment Program. And she's gonna talk in more detail about how we see that relationship between brain health and education manifest in the real world. Lois, over to you. Thank you, Zeylan, and a uh, warm welcome to our guests. Uh, my name is Lois Kamau, and I'm the Associate Director for the Girls Empowerment Program. Our program offers protection through education in the belief that through continuous uh, self-development and learning, our girls and young women uh, in the program will grow to build a resilient life and develop a voice, not only for themselves, but also for their children and others in the society. The program is very intentional in ensuring that the girls and young women mental health issues are addressed in a timely manner because uh, simple triggers can cause a girl to relieve the traumatic experiences of the past. Uh, for instance, a voice or a certain movement from a teacher or a peer can take her into the past and out of the present moment, which really affects concentration in class. Many girls in the program exhibit symptoms of hypervigilance or disassociation, which limits their ability to engage in academic activities and general knowledge building. Refugees, psychosocial counselors and teachers bring the participants into an awareness that the past cannot be ignored. They support the girls and young women to make a resolve not to forget, but to face the traumatic experiences, face the triggers, and affirm themselves that the experience and triggers will not have a hold on their present or their future. Handling many emotions and the dynamics of life as a refugee in Kenya can be a very big challenge, and even more so because of their age. Uh, children of refugee girls and young women may be impacted by trauma too. Uh, the staff in the daycare works with the girl mothers and the counselors to have child-friendly therapy sessions where the, the children are helped to deal with any trauma or anxieties that they could be experiencing or picking from their mothers. As you know, children learn a lot from what they see and hear with the people they spend their time with. When children are safe, the girl mothers are able to pay attention in class. 
Uh, and therapy sessions and uh, individualized sessions help learners to feel safe, deal with their past and live more in the present and strive to live a better life every day. Uh, the girl empowerment program establishes a routine for girls. And while this sometimes get really overwhelming for them, we know how important routine and boundaries are for all adolescents and especially those recovering from traumatic childhood. We explain to them what it means to have set time for specific activities and its impact on who they are today and who they will become in the future. This enables them to develop a routine in their system and life. We have seen them better take care of themselves and their babies. They have uh, come to develop uh, eating time, uh, play time, sleeping time for the children, and they're even able to manage their emotions better. We have seen girls blossom to take up leadership positions in the campus, and this gives us the heart to do what we do every day. I would say supporting mental health programs impact not only that one girl, but everyone around her. Uh, 